Hi everyone, here's a technique video based off the Q&A we did a, a couple weeks ago. Um, there's quite a, a lot of questions, so this might be a fairly long video, plus it's about 3.30 in the morning here, so I might ramble a bit, so uh, buckle up. Uh, first off, this is just a video uh, demonstrating my personal technique. Uh, so this is, not a, uh, this is not the gospel, this is not the way everyone should hold their sticks. Uh, this is just me talking about what I think is right for me. Uh, everyone, everyone's going to have something different uh, depending on what style you're in, uh, what type of band or ensemble you got to play for, uh, who your teacher is, who your drum coach is, whatever. There, there's tons of different scenarios where you're going to have to hold the sticks differently. That, and that's, 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 firstly, I think a really important concept to uh, understand. Um, I see pretty often a lot of people stuck on certain concepts of this is the correct way and then whatever their technique is um, and uh, I, I just don't think that's a good way to go because it's gonna it's gonna evolve from like I said before what, what type of music you're playing and even just what type of drum you're hitting uh, so yeah once again this is just gonna be about uh, how I like to play so I guess uh, we'll just dive in. Uh, first question was just to explain the basic technique. So here's how I like to play. Starting at the tips of the sticks. Um, I usually try to strike uh, every drum within a couple inches, uh, or have the tips strike within a couple inches of each other. And this is just for consistency uh, on the tone of the drum. As I'm sure all you know, when you when you hit a drum in a different spot, it's gonna sound differently. And even if your sticks are a little bit off, you're gonna get this kind of like ping pop, ping pop sound if they're not all the same. So if you're gonna to commit to the center of the drum where it's drier, make sure they're both there. If you're gonna to commit to the edge and you want the ping sound, then make them both there. Uh, some, sometimes just having that, that alternating of two different tones uh, it's just it's just another really subtle point that uh, if, if you know if you ignore enough of these little subtleties that really stacks up to a, a, a pretty sloppy drum sound. Uh, so definitely keep in mind of that. Moving up uh, for you know general snare drum playing, I think it's a good idea to have a 90 degree angle at the stick, um, and that's kind of a good general rule of thumb a lot of people use. Um, I mean, I think that the, the truth is, I mean, you know, what is 90 degrees to your body? It's just a, you know, it's just a number, but it, this is kind of a nice square edge to kind of aim for. And uh, this comes into play as we kind of move our way down the stick. I'll show you in a sec. Um, of course, you know, in different situations, and you'll see me in this video, it's, it'll, it'll move. But uh, if you're just going to sit and play on a snare drum, try to keep it a nice square. Moving back the stick, uh, a really important thing here is uh, keeping your thumb on the stick pretty much at all times. Um, I, I think this is a huge part of the, the equation here is having this fulcrum set up. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't grip the stick um, with the index finger opposite the thumb. I usually favor uh, the middle finger being on the other side of it and this kind of sets up my fulcrum. Uh, sometimes I'll, it'll end up or being more like a, like a triangle between the three of them. Um, I, I don't like using this method. Um, I, th I think, unless it's a buzz roll. A buzz roll is the exception, but uh, for the most part, I like to leave the index finger out front just a little bit, and it's there for more of a stability instead of actually driving the stick. I think the, the the reason why I do this is because if, if we think of this as the fulcrum point or the teeter-totter, um, if you paid attention in physics class at all, you know you want to be further away from that fulcrum to get more leverage. So basically pushing the stick up here is, is a waste of energy and you can even see it in your finger when it turns red and white. Um, I really like to favor the back fingers. So if we go back from the stick a little bit more, I pretty much always have these two guys wrapped around the back. If we're further away from the fulcrum, we've got more leverage. That's a big deal right there. So underneath that, we've got all the fingers on the sticks, thumbs on the side, flip it over, 
Most of the times you want the back of your hands up. Again, this will change, especially in the right hand. Uh, if you're doing all this correctly with all your fingers on the stick, um, you should be able to see the butt end of the stick over the top of your wrist when you're looking down on your hands. Now the reason for this is if, if you just have your hands sitting naturally here, um, if you want the stick to fall underneath all your fingers, it's going to kind of naturally have this angle a little bit anyway. Uh, some guys like to hold their, their, or girls, like to hold their sticks like this and have it more in line with their arm. And, and at times this, this is cool. I'll, I'll do this uh, occasionally on a ride cymbal. I think uh, actually Mike Mangini uh, does something quite similar to this. Um, I, I, I'm not crazy about this because when you flip this upside down, the pinky is a little bit, it's a little too far away for that pinky to reach the stick and, and then get that leverage I'm talking about. But uh, with certain kind of molar type strokes, uh, this, this works well too. But fingers on the back of the stick, I think that's huge. Moving back further yet, uh, the wrist is going to be a huge part of it uh, when we're talking about this molar stroke again. Uh, so kind of hold that thought. Uh, going back further yet, the elbows. Um, there's great players who keep their elbows down and keep them sticking out. I don't think it matters. Just pick whatever one you like and go with it. I like mine down. I don't move my arms a lot when I play. Um, so I, I just like to stay relaxed. That, that's kind of part of... I think my loose grip. So my elbows definitely stay down. And then I set up my drums that way. I don't set my cymbals too high. I don't have to reach up for anything. Um, so keeping it relaxed. Moving back further yet, shoulders. Uh, this is a, a thing a lot of people overlook. Um, I notice with uh, other drummers sometimes, especially with students, we'll be playing along and all of a sudden they don't realize it, but their shoulders are super tense when they're playing. Uh, just try to keep that in, in your mind that you might want to just drop your shoulders, relax, chill out. Um, you know, that, that extra tension in your body isn't going to be good for you. Um, the basic stroke for me, uh, again, it depends on what I'm playing. If, it's, if, if I'm hitting a drum at that moment or a cymbal or whatever, uh, it's going to be different. But for the most part, um, I just... We'll do a basic tap stroke, and I, myself, I don't usually have a conscious effort towards thinking of upstrokes and downstrokes, so if you're not familiar with that, what that is, um, some people like to have the idea of a downstroke is when you strike the drum and the stick stays down, and that's a, you, you want to think of that, like, okay, this is my downstroke because my next stroke needs to be a soft one, and I'll have it there. And then an upstroke is when you lift up in preparation for the following stroke to be an accent. So it's like, okay, here's my upstroke, here's my downstroke. I'm not into that myself. I, I just think your sticks are gonna do what they need to do naturally anyway. It's it's just an extra brain process that to me it's not necessary. So I don't I don't apply that method at all. I just play what I need to. If I need to accent or not, my sticks are gonna do that. If I'm gonna play a buzz roll, and I can't do a buzz roll quite on this thing, uh, that's where I'll kind of break some rules. That's where I'll pinch up front in the tight, uh, <laughs> pinch, pinch up tight in the front. <laughs> um, so for me, uh, a buzz roll, it's, it's not comfortable when I do them. I, I couldn't sit and do a buzz roll for half an hour straight because uh, there is tension in the front. So I, I grip it right at the fulcrum, and then I will lift off a little bit in the back. I won't, you know, look like a fifth grader and stick my fingers down, but um, I will release it a little bit because I think that stick needs to wobble back here to get that vibration for a clean buzz stroke. So that's, that's kind of one of my exceptions. Um, when it comes to double strokes, the third type, uh, it depends on the speed and what surface we're playing. Faster speeds is more of a rebound. Slower speeds, it's going to be more of a wrist-driven stroke. I think if you want to get good double strokes, you want to get both of those set, you know, mindsets going.
So let's jump into another question here. Uh, first one, how much time do you spend practicing technique? Um, well, I guess I'd have to look back. Um, I didn't really start hitting it hard, I think, until college, um, kind of zeroing in the technique thing. In high school, um, I began taking drum lessons, and that, that, that's where I first learned about you know, the importance of fulcrum and relaxing. Um, but as far as like really, really looking at how I hold the sticks and, and working on it, I, I didn't start doing that until college. Um, there's, a, there's a few, I guess if you're looking for exercises, there's a few exercises I did um, and I kind of had down to a routine. One of them is the introduction page in a book called Rudiment Grooves by Rick Considine. Uh, in, in the introduction page, there's a list of what, what he calls the drum set rudiments, and they're, um, it's just a you know, one-page list of maybe you know, 20 of them in a piece, and I basically made kind of a routine out of that to play through the whole thing. Then I would play the first measure for, I think, like 30 seconds. I play through the whole thing again, go back through, get to the second measure, do that for 30 seconds, play the whole thing, go through, and then so on and so on. And that added up to end up being like a 20 or 30 minute exercise, um, depending on how fast I took it. I would make sure to do that at least once a day um, as part of the routine, just to get the get the rudiments in shape. Um, I like playing snare drum pieces, uh, so get any you know get get the old school Wilcoxon Pratt. All those, um, you know, rudimental snare drumming books. I think I think those are cool. I like spending time doing that. I'm not really into modern DCI stuff. Um, I mean, I think it's great. I, I like watching videos and stuff like that online, like anyone else. But I, I don't. Uh, there's some rudiments in there that I just I just don't get into. I I, I don't. I don't know. I'm, I just don't find the use for them on drum set. Some people do. I just don't. But. Uh, Anyway, um, so the, the Rudiment Grooves page, I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, the other thing is I just spent a lot of time. I mean, in, in college, um, I practiced 30 to 40 hours a week. Um, it was a music school. It was Berkeley College of Music. It was, that's what you do. You, you're there to you know, be immersed in music. And that, that's a huge part of this whole technique thing. Um, a lot of this stuff, they're not things that uh, I can just tell you to do and you go do it. Um, they're things that you have to spend many hours doing. Um, I took a few labs at college uh, with Mike Mangini, and he always had a, a good thing to say when he was talking about certain concepts. Because if you want to talk about a guy who practiced for hours and hours a day, uh, that's one of them. He always said you have to earn it. So it's not, not about like understanding it it's about earning it so if you had a concept that you couldn't you couldn't do he's like well because you haven't earned it yet you haven't put in the time yet so i think that that's a really important thing to kind of have in your head that you gotta you gotta earn these things you gotta spend the time uh, but anyway back to the technique thing um i also uh, got into the alan dawson rudimental ritual for a while uh that was kind of a fun routine um you know, I was just looking for more stuff to do. It's like a 12-page thing. You can play it with sticks. You can play it with brushes. It's just a good way to clean out all the kinks with your technique. Um, you know, any any rudimental thing I like, I like playing. Um, you know, actually, that's that's um, with the second book I wrote. Um, this one, you should. Uh, this is basically just a catalog of all the things my hands do. I mean, it's it's. Uh, you know, if I ever sit down at a practice pad and noodle around, warming up, whatever, uh, it's probably something out of this book. So um, these are basically all my favorite little, you know, if you still call them licks on a snare drum. Um, and then I just kind of categorized them all by rudiment. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm plugging my own stuff here, but I think this would be another uh, really good one if, if you're interested in my technique, because this is all, this is, this is what I play, this is what my hands do, all this stuff right here. Um, and, and this book in particular is, it's 
not meant to be like snare pieces necessarily. Like this is uh, in a way almost kind of like a workout routine. So these pages are meant to be played over and over and over and over to kind of zero in your technique. Time-wise, if you know if you want to get your hands in shape, um, I mean, really you should you should spend probably you know close to an hour a day on it. Um, you know, it depends on what area. So practice pad, rudiment stuff. You know, give that 30 minutes, and then uh, you know, spend another 30 minutes playing jazz ride cymbal, just the ride cymbal. That's a whole nother discussion. But just sit and put on, put on an album, and uh, you know, try your triple strokes. And it doesn't have to be up tempo stuff. Just getting that whole thing together. Um, ride cymbal technique. I'll talk about briefly. Uh, on to next question. So, me, yeah. To answer the question, how much time do I spend practicing technique? Uh, Quite a bit, a lot. It depends on, you know, I mean, lately I haven't spent much time practicing on it just because I'm working, I'm gigging, I'm teaching, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, usually a, a few, few hours a day. Um, it, it wasn't like conscious, like, okay, I'm going to sit here and practice my technique. Um, but it was, you know, through learning a bunch of random vocabulary. So anyway, on, on to the next. How to improve speed. Uh, the person asking this, I think, was referring to single stroke rolls. Um, so, okay, so to rewind a bit, in high school I was obsessed with single stroke rolls. I thought that was the coolest thing and I had to get my single stroke rolls fast and that would impress everybody. Um, so, and, and then uh, in college I kind of, I kind of saw the light and was like, wait a minute, this isn't that, you know, isn't that cool. Um, or necessarily rewarding, and then that's where I kind of turned to the rudiment thing. So I spent the time playing all the rudiments, uh, you know, cruising through that, and then all of a sudden um, I found while practicing all these other rudiments, um, all of a sudden my single strokes were much faster than they were, and I hadn't even been practicing them. I hadn't been sitting doing like eight on a hand anymore. Um, so just through practicing my rudiments um, with a right hand lead, a left hand lead, trying to you know get that balance happening, my single strokes naturally just kind of became quicker. I don't have super fast single strokes right now. I mean, there's guys who could totally smoke me right now, but um, just from playing, um, you know, playing every day, that kind of naturally improved it. Uh, you know, if if you really want to get your singles in shape. You know, and, and you want to zero that in, then, you know, yeah, you can do your eight on a hand. Uh, you can set up some kind of system. You know, you can find a metronome tempo and, you know, log that and work it up every week. You know, but uh, it's I, I, I don't like doing that type of stuff. Um, it's just learning rudiments. I mean, the rudiments I'll practice them along to a metronome to to push myself, and to not accidentally drag them, but. Uh, there's kind of more fun ways to do it. Like another way would be put on a song on the drum set that has um, that has a 16th note hi-hat rhythm. So it would take like funky, uh, funky Drummer, James Brown. I mean, there's tons of them, you know. Um, and try to make it through the whole song. It's like a six-minute song. And just sit and do that and make that part of your routine make it six minutes doing that and you're playing along to the song so you're not allowed to slow down because if you play it by yourself you might slow down and not realize it and you'll find I mean your arm will feel like it's going to start on fire uh, you know a couple minutes into that but if you push yourself every day and make that a goal to finish the song your right hand's going to be awesome you know in a few weeks uh, if you really want to go nuts do the same thing with your left hand on the hi-hat um, but uh, you know, try to find ways maybe just incorporate it into your playing instead of making it a, like a sitting and doing push-ups, like this thing I have to sit and do for X amount of minutes a day, I mean, this many reps or whatever. Just just add it to your playing. Um, so I guess yeah, the speed thing. Uh, spend many hours, push yourself. Um, the metronome is is actually a. a as well as a timekeeping tool, it's also a good speed building tool. Just like I was talking about, um, not uh, not letting yourself slow down. It's kind of like the lie detector; it, it keeps pushing you forward. Um, also, 
you know, maybe don't, uh, a, lot, a lot of people will work on like little bursts of speed. Um, try to set up something where you put the, the click at a speed that's a little bit lower than your maximum, but then say, okay, I'm gonna do this for a minute straight. And then you'll find that 60 minutes, is, or sorry, 60 seconds is quite a long time when you're just doing that. And you gotta sit and play, and all of a sudden, you know, 45 seconds in, you're totally locked up. Um, because usually that endurance is going to be more important to you anyway than, than a small burst of, of a single stroke. So think like a long distance runner a lot of times. I think, I think that's, that's a little bit better deal. And overall, I mean, don't worry about your speed. It, it's not a huge deal. Uh, I mean, really when it comes down to it, like no one's ever like, I don't know hired me and been like, man, we just love how fast you are, you know? Uh, it's just, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not the end of the, not the end of the road. So if, if you're not the fastest guy out there, don't worry about it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not a huge deal. Um, anyway, on to the next question. Uh, can you show different grips? And there's a couple similar questions for grouping together. One was, uh, different nuances when moving around the set. Um, moving around the set. So, when we're on the snare drum, or when I am, uh, doing anything, whether it be a, you know, roll, a fill, a little second line thing, uh, you know, whatever, I'm kind of sticking close to uh, the, uh, the technique, you know, basic snare drum te technique I was talking about before. Same if I go to the uh, first tom right here. Everything kind of stays the same. If I go to the floor tom, I just basically just roll my hand over. So as I'm at the kit, my hand doesn't actually really go anywhere. I just roll it over and then now I'm at the floor tom. Same with the ride symbol. I go here and now I'm on the ride. My hands don't ha actually have to go that far when I'm playing. In general, what I like to do on the kit is if I'm going out to something, my hand rolls out, and then I kind of morph into the, this technique, which I'll talk about in a second. If I go in, it stays the same. So like, for example, my right hand, if I go to the hi-hat, I keep the back of the hand up. Every once in a while, I'll, you know, I'll do the French grip thing on the hi-hat, but usually I like to try to keep the back of the hand up. Same thing with the left. I go down to the floor tom, that back of the hand stays up. I don't really ever go to the hi-hat that much, but in case I do, you know, you kind of stick the thumb up. So that's what I like to do on the um, the kit. As far as uh, you know, different surfaces are concerned. Uh, the drum set, starting at the snare drum, going down your toms, uh, they get looser and looser, and the drums are bigger and bigger on a typical kit. On the bigger drums, there's no rebound, so you need to play with your wrists. You need wrist strokes. So if you're going to use a double stroke roll on a floor tom, um, you got to have strong wrist. It's not going to come out. It's not going to sound good if you don't. So it's really important to practice on dull surfaces like this pad right here or a pillow or a folded up towels. When you're up in the snare drum, then you can use your, your rebound a little more, your buzzes. Same with the cymbal. Um, but you've got you to get kind of good at, you know, slow, fast, loud, soft, bouncy or not, you know, kind of every combination of those. Um, another question, how consistent should the grip be when playing, especially in different styles? Uh, so it's kind of, it's kind of close to the previous one. Um, you know, I wouldn't worry about, uh, I wouldn't worry about consistency necessarily uh, as much, um, I mean, as, as a rule, like I wouldn't worry about following a rule. Um, I think it's good to be consistent uh, as, much, as much as you can, just so you're, you're exercising the same muscle group. Um, you know, like the, there's a question here later about traditional grip, and I'll talk about this more, but it, you know, you know if, if you're using a similar muscle group, oftentimes, I mean, you might as well just keep the same one working. Um, it's, it's not going to be, uh, I mean, your muscles don't care what style of music you're playing. Uh, it's going to be more like variations in volume. Um, you know, if you're going to go from jazz, you know, to ACDC, you know, yeah, it's going to be a little bit different, but, but I think it's, 
mainly a a volume thing. So if 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 I'm playing something lighter style, you know, whatever it might be, um, yeah, I'm thinking I'm using more rebound. My fingers are still um, intervening a little bit, but I'm still using rebound. Uh, if I'm playing louder, uh, for me, what I'll do is I just hold the stick tighter. So if I'm really going for it, I'm not letting them go. I'm, I'm just grabbing and swinging like a baseball bat, chopping an axe, basically. Um, but s still using the back fingers. Um, and, uh, you know, oftentimes the, the, the front finger will just kind of stick forward. Um, and, and this might seem like a big no-no, but if you look carefully, m many drummers, different, different styles, hold their sticks this way. I mean, if you look at anything of Tony Williams with his right hand playing the ride cymbal, he's got something similar to this going. Even if you look at rock guys, if you look at pictures of Josh Freeze, he's doing the same thing. Dave Grohl, even Lars does it. You know, it, it's just a, using the back fingers. I think it's such a huge thing, um, you know, whether you're chopping or not. But it's not wrong. I, one time I was at a show, um, it was Taylor Hawkins, his side project band called the Coattail Riders, and they were playing in uh, Rhode Island. I took a train out to see him from Boston. And it was in a small club. I can't remember where it was. And, and it, since it was right next to the Boston show, no one came to this Rhode Island show, so it was like you know, maybe 20 people there. So I got to stand you know, probably like five feet from his kit and watch him play up close for a couple hours. And that was really interesting to see his technique up close. And he, um, he a lot of times was doing this, you know, um, without, without the back fingers on there at all. And I mean, he's playing more rock gigs than anyone, you know, right now. Uh, and he gets by with that too. So, you know, again, like I was saying before, it's just, you know, different strokes for different folks. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, it's it's always, a, with the drum set, it's always a different grip depending on um, what you're hitting, how you're hitting it. Uh, next question, best way to make the left hand as comfortable as the right? Okay, so with this, um, I think uh, when we're talking about drum set, a really important thing here is um, don't, don't worry about making them perfectly balanced in a drum set setting. If, if, if you're gonna play just snare drum and do that, then, then yeah, you want that to be as, as even as possible. But on the drum set, the right and left hand have different roles most of the time. Most of the time, your left hand is chopping backbeats for you know, whatever, whatever kind of backbeat music you're playing. And then, or it's comping lightly on the snare drum for jazz type stuff. And, um, and for me, the way I play, most of the time my left hand is on uh, the snare drum. The right hand is kind of your riding hand. It's the ride cymbal, it's the hi-hat, you know, it's the one kind of venturing around the drums when doing fills. Uh, so just kind of accept that it's, they don't have to be a mirror image of one another because they have different jobs. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, if, if you want to get the the balance thing going, this goes back to the rudiment talk, you know, um, really get your rudiments in shape, spend um, spend time playing right hand lead, left hand lead, um, all sorts of different surfaces. I'm probably going to say that a million times in the rest of this video. Uh, let's see, let's go on to the next one. Uh, oh, sorry, back up one. The natural imbalance between the right and the left hand. Um, so if you're right handed, you're playing a right handed kit. Um, your uh, your right hand's gonna get it's already stronger and it's gonna get way more of a workout. Um, so it, it's it's gonna spring way ahead, you know, of, of the left hand. Um, so you know, just keep that in mind. You you got to work this thing really hard if you want to keep it, you know, balanced. If that's really your goal, then put your ride symbol on the left side. Um, you know, you can play like Billy Cobham and do that you know Dennis Chambers says in a lot of interviews that he thinks that's the correct way to do it because then that your hats here your ride here and then opens your right for doing other stuff you know it's a different way of playing um, so anyway on to the next one uh, how do you execute a rim shot with traditional grip and then another question basically just talking about general traditional grip um, so real quick thing about traditional grip um, I, I gave up playing it 
years ago, um, or playing it seriously, um, one of my, you know, best teachers, and he's probably my most influential guy, uh, Rick Considine, the author of that, that book I talked about earlier, he said right away, you know, one of the easiest things you can do to make yourself better um, improve your hands is just pick a grip and go with it. So don't don't dance around between mashed and tradition traditional. Um, pick one and go with it. They're totally separate muscle groups, um, and it, it, if this is already your weaker hand and you're gonna exercise this way to play, different muscle group this way to play, you're just making it harder for yourself. Um, it, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't make a difference unless you practice 10 hours a day. Um, just pick one and go with it. And for me, the, the, the decision then was, um, okay, well, I like traditional grip because I like having this finesse when I play lightly, but I struggle to get volume, particularly with backbeats. With the match grip, I can get the power or I can uh, just work on getting, you know, this to have as nice of a touch as my traditional grip would. So I just chose, you know what, I've been playing for years already up to that point with match grip. I'm just gonna stack on top of those hours I've already had. You know, I'm gonna surrender my, you know, want to look as cool as Tony or Elvin um, and just play match grip, even when I'm playing jazz or whatever. Um, and I went with it and, you know, it, it's, you know, it's just kind of how I play now. I mean, Terry Lynn Carrington plays matched. Bill Stewart plays matched. Horacio Hernandez plays matched. Like, it, it it's not a style thing. Just because you're playing jazz or blues doesn't mean you have to play traditional. Um, so, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Let's see. Um, oh, the rim shot thing. So, anyway. So, I'm just going to be kind of brief with the, the traditional grip thing. Just because I, I, don't, I don't spend my hours working on it. Um, I'm a match grip guy. I mean, if, if I ever play it, it's just because I'm messing around. Um, so anyway, f I found that uh, to, to get a good rim shot with traditional grip, um, I pretty much let go of the fingers. And what's happening is I'm, I'm actually pushing with the thumb. So when you're holding normally, you know, we all know kind of how to do the grip here, but uh, when you come down, you want to get the, the full rim shot it's really the I, the pressure is put on right here and kind of counterbalanced by resting on the top and actually I think it was an interview with Steve Ferrone or someone talking about Steve Ferrone who has the same birthday as me by the way but uh, Steve Ferrone uh, I think mentioned doing the same thing where he's he's playing with Tom Petty and he's having to crank these back beats and he plays traditional grip and just doing all that doing that all night, he basically said, you know, I just forget the fingers, I'm just doing that. Uh, so, you maybe give that a shot, if, if you know, that's a deal of yours. Um, the, the, the rim shot, hitting the rim and the, the head at the same time, it's, it's such a muscle memory programming thing, you just gotta spend time doing it. And people do, I mean, look at Stuart Copeland, you know, Vinny, you know, uh, all these guys who just rock traditional grip, it's awesome, you know, so it, it can be done. You just gotta you know, put in the hours again, like I was talking about. Uh, basic traditional grip, you know, how to hold. Um, I'll just do a quick crash course in this in case uh, someone wants a quick lesson. Uh, the, I think the main thing is, is first being able to do this. Hold the stick at the fulcrum and make this happen. You're holding the stick here. You're feeling that balance. And yeah, from here now we start adding the fingers. With match grip, the fulcrum is more in the front, the force is coming in the back. With traditional, the fingers are in the front of the fulcrum, which is uh, a little bit different. So we lay the stick down, nestle it in the crease here, the thumb goes over, uh, index finger kind of meets the thumb. It doesn't have to touch. You can let go, that's fine at times, it's, you know, it happens. But in general, the touch here, the middle finger is not going to do a whole lot. Uh, you can have it resting on the stick or not. This is for me if I'm playing, by the way. This isn't a, you know, drum corps guy here. So uh, the stick will rest on this first knuckle of the ring finger, and the pinky will go under it just for support. 
And when you're playing, it's actually going to be kind of bouncing around between those two fingers. But again, this isn't this isn't my area of you know I haven't spent all the hours on the traditional grip. So uh, you know if 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 you're really looking to dig into that, uh, I mean there's there's an army of guys on YouTube who can you know really kind of help you zero that in. But uh, so yeah, there's traditional grip talk in a nutshell. Maybe let's uh, hit the next uh, next question. How do you stay relaxed? Uh, and this person was basically ref referring to, you know, says your your technique looks so fluid, so loose. Um, I I uh, I guess I you know if we're gonna talk the molar technique versus the Gladstone technique, or just the kind of the, you know, the, the basic chop or the whip, I favor the whipping motion. I always have, even before I um, even before I was taught the method. Um, I just I just like thinking more like a, a whip, and I hold the sticks again with the thumb, kind of more in the middle of the fingers, holding nice and loose. And as far as you know the the looseness of it, again that's that's a lot of time, a lot of staying loose. Um, one person who I actually really admire their technique is a piano player, Michelle Camilo. Um, I saw him a, a few times live. I mean, his hands look like, they look like rags. They're, they're just so loose and fluid. It's, it's, it's really cool. You know, and that's kind of something I've always kind of, kind of aspired to have. And a lot of that is just kind of an efficiency, efficiency thing. Um, you know, utilize the inertia as much as you can. Don't make the stick do all the work. So yeah, I favor the molar side of it. Definitely the whip motion. You can even hear, you know, that whip sound. Hopefully, you guys can pick that up. Another thing is when I'm playing the stick, you can hear it moving in my hand so it's not tight it's that if you can hear the difference this that uh, especially actually that really kind of comes into play when playing on on a like a bell pattern on a ride cymbal yeah, I just think of it as Definitely more of a whip. Um, as far as yeah, how to you know to to directly answer the question, how do I stay relaxed? I mean, a lot of times it's it's just a it's a choice. You got to make a constant uh, conscious effort, pretty much at all times, to to not uh, you know like you know, I have some students who you know if if they're they seem to favor putting their thumbs up or they uh, you know they want to grip with the index finger or they stick their elbows out or you know whatever. It's like there's only so much I can do you know besides just tell you you got to stop doing that you know so a lot of it is just keep it on the forefront of your mind um, so anyway let's go on to the next one moon gel pad better than rubber pads yes absolutely man uh, so uh, okay the rubber pads the basic you know the real feel ones or whatever you know there's tons of them on the market uh, those are cool if you are um, if you're I think if you're starting off and you're trying to learn how to utilize that fulcrum and the rebound but if you are um, if you're if you're into it and you're a serious player uh, playing on those is, isn't helping you that's not what a drum feels like um, it makes you sound way better than you are uh, you know your double strokes will be perfect on it and you if, if you spend hours on one of those things you probably know the feeling you sit you play that you warm up whatever and then you go sit at the drum set and then it's like you feel paralyzed it just doesn't work out and that's because you're used to that shock of hitting it and it bouncing back like crazy again this is drum set if you're doing drum core and playing on a Kevlar head you know it's gonna be a, you know, probably a different story but um, for drum set 
there's not a lot of rebound on that thing, so uh, you want to plan something dull. Uh, this is this is a, a I think a really really important thing. Um, even if you there's a couple of videos floating around there of Dennis Chambers talking in a clinic, and he said just throw the rubber pad in the trash, get rid of it, like it's 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 no good. Um, and he, uh, you know, I guess he says he heard that from Buddy Rich, you know, playing on pillows, playing on dull surfaces. So, um, yeah, I think this thing's awesome. I think this is the way to go. It, it, it just, it's, it's like playing, um, it feels more like a drum, you know, because when you get down to a floor, Tom, there's, there's going to be no rebound on anything. So, yeah. To answer the question, I think, yeah, this is way better than rubber pad. The only thing this thing can't do is buzz rolls. So if, if you're going to practice, you know, an orchestral type snare piece, uh, then yeah, you got to use rubber pad for that. But type of sticks. Okay, what type of sticks do I like? Uh, many types of sticks. Um, I'll just show you some of my favorites. Uh, boy, this portion of it would totally lose any opportunity I might have for <laughs> drumstick companies because I bounce around between all of them. Uh, these ones are Vader uh, Extreme Design 5As. Uh, I really like these for pretty much general playing where I'm allowed to be really loud. Uh, they're a little bit longer. Um, there's weight in the front, so it's kind of got this cool like throw feel to it. And and the style, the, the, the tip like really lights up the ride cymbal. I think that the shape of the tip you have on your, your ride, or your your stick is really important, and your sound, that's, I think it's a huge factor, and this thing, it has a really strong definition, which I really like, because um, I, 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 don't, I don't slam the drums, um, so I just like to be able to use kind of a whip motion with a large stick to get the volume out, instead of, instead of just like kind of battling it and hitting hard, uh, so I think this is an awesome stick. This does not work for jazz, though, this is, a, this is an awful jazz stick, so... Um, that's kind of this thing's Achilles heel. So I, I, I would really like to be able to zero in to just one stick for everything, but I just can't do it. So this one is, is this one's a cool, you know, general purpose stick for when you're allowed to be playing at a loud volume. But if, if you gotta do something like a gig where you gotta be quiet, this is a bad choice. Um, for those type of things where I gotta be softer, uh, I like the John Riley stick uh, from Zildjian. I think this thing is awesome. The balance on this thing is amazing. It makes a ride cymbal sound really good. Uh, it just feels really good in the hands. It's just a little bit smaller. This one's all chewed up. I've been using this one for years. Um, yeah, this thing is this is an excellent stick. I, I, I think it's, it's it's just it's really popular actually. Um, Bill Stewart actually used this at one point. I uh, just kind of took a peek at his stick bag once. Um, Terry Lynn Carrington used this as well, even though both of them have their own Zildjian models. But uh, this is just a, this is an excellent stick. If you haven't played it, check it out. Uh, this is this is a really cool jazz one. Um, I've always liked the Vic Firth SD2 Bolero. Um, this is kind of an oddball stick. <clears throat> um, if you're playing anything orchestral snare drum, where it's like all you got to do is make that snare drum sound good, uh, this is a sweet stick for it. Uh, made of maple, it's got a, again a really good balance. That balance thing is, is hugely important for me. Um, this thing also makes ride cymbals sound really nice. Um, there's a trade-off though. So if you have to play a super soft gig like in a restaurant, where it's you know you're abandoning all cool licks and just be as quiet as you can. Um, this is a, a great choice. Um, the downside is that it just, it's it's so unnatural and it's maple and it's wide. It's just, it's a, it's gonna build you a totally different technique than what you would be using when you're using these sticks. So I, I feel like after a long gig with these, if I'm using them on the drum set, I feel like, okay, I just did a, you know, three one hour set gig and my hands, I'm not even warmed up. It's like I didn't even play. It, they're just, it's weird. Um, but uh, I mean, there's guys who use these as uh, their main drum set stick, and they're awesome. You know, uh, Francisco Mela is one of them. Uh, I studied with him for a while at Berkeley. He, uh, he at least at one point used this as his main stick. Um, and he made it sound great. Another downside to this thing is you can't do a, a traditional like cross stick. The way the shoulder is shaped, um, the tip will actually rock off the head by the time you hit the rim, so it doesn't work for that. That's kind of a 
big drawback. But anyway, this is a cool stick. It feels great. Yeah, definitely a nice one. Uh, let's see, another oddball thing. Uh, Zildjian John Riley double ended stick. Um, man, this thing has come in handy on gigs. You gotta do cymbal rolls, you know, make softer timpani sounds on the uh, toms. This thing's excellent. Definite, definite one you wanna have in your bag. Uh, Vic Firth T1 General. This is a sweet set of mallets. Um, if you haven't tried timpani mallets on the drum set, go get some. This is cool. Um, and then what I did is I went to a shoe store and those little things you're supposed to slip over your feet while you're trying on the shoes, I just took a couple of those and I slipped them over here and taped them off just so the, the you know, the felt doesn't get all busted up. Um, so yeah, these, these are excellent sticks. Uh, the T2 cartwheels are great as well too. Uh, brushes, Regal Tip Classic Brush. This is the brush. This is the one everyone uses. Uh, this is this is the cool one. To me, this is like this is all I need. Then what I do is I put them in about that far, push them up against the wall or the floor or something, and, and bend them up. You know, you probably see Steve Gadd doing that. Um, that just kind of keeps keeps the the tips out of all the scuffs on your head or falling into that wedge, um, and it kind of makes a cool thick slap sound when you actually just do a tap. Um, so I really like these, and they actually they kind of make this little click sound when you play them on a cymbal and um, I, some people might not like that but I think that's kind of cool I, I actually like this sound um, just looking in the stick bag I think that's that pretty much covers it um, so anyway back to the back to the list of questions uh, index finger fulcrum versus second finger fulcrum what should beginners use uh, most people in most people in like, you know, when they start band in like fifth or sixth grade in school, usually the directors are gonna tell them the index finger way. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to do an easier double stroke, you know, to start off. If I had to teach a kid, you know, it's like they gotta do a double stroke by next week, I would say, well, yeah, do it this way. You know, it's, it's pretty foolproof. Um, but if you're thinking longevity, I would just say start off, start off on this path right away. Um, I think this is a, I think it's just the way to go. You know, I've started off tons and tons of kids doing this technique, and uh, it pretty much always worked out. Um, and and a lot of times they would just do it naturally by just by sitting next to me every week and just watching me. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a fun thing to watch too. Is is especially with younger kids, they're just so used to just watching and following. Um, and then I, you know, all of a sudden there's a you know, person who's, you know, in fourth grade or something and they're holding their sticks, you know, nice and fluid and loose and everything and it's like, oh cool, they just copied. So yeah, I, I would vote the second finger fulcrum, you know, coming from the start. I think that's a the way to do it. Uh, on to the next question. How do you play relax at faster tempos? Um, and this, this, I can kind of tie this into the next question, which is, uh, it's kind of longer, but it's, it says, I always try to keep my hands loose, but during gigs, my technique seems to go out the window and I can feel myself pinching the fulcrum more, causing an ache at the base of the thumb. Do you ever have this issue? So this basically, I, I kind of lump these together. It's about fatigue. Um, I think a, a really important thing there is, is just to try to always be better than your gig. Um, have more capability than you need to to play your show or be in your band or or whatever um so you know you want to practice that way um one people or one mistake a lot of people make i think when they, when they're practicing is is they'll play you know their beat or whatever and then they'll go and, and then it's like okay sweet i got that one okay i'll try the next thing and it's like well hold up you only play that beat for like 15 seconds there like an average song is like four minutes you know you gotta you gotta practice that endurance um so you know you know like take your itunes playlist and put your whole band's list on there and however many sets you gotta play and play through that every day you know and, and don't stop you know you if you make a mistake you gotta keep going you know simulate a performance um, and, and you'll find that that, that does wonders um, for uh, for your technique. Then you go to actually play, and you know you've prepared properly. You, you've you've replicated that scenario a few times, and your body adapted to it. And, and now you're strong enough, or stronger than you need to be to do it. And then that will allow you to stay comfortable a little more. Um, 
you know and and if if you don't have a gig that allows you to perform as much uh you probably want to practice that way to stay competitive um you know you know some people will get in a touring band and they'll get in a situation where they can perform five nights a week um you know they're gonna they're gonna also like you know they might have been better anyway and that cause them to get the gig and then now that they're in the gig they're going to get even better yet because they're going to have more opportunity to practice so you got to you got to simulate that get your set list together um play it every day pretend you're on tour even though you're only you're only playing in your basement you know and, and you play that show every day uh you're, you're going to really notice uh your, your technique improve um so that that's kind of one angle at it otherwise the the, the whole relaxed thing um in in general um you know, it's just it's just staying loose. Um, you know, it's it's a this this thing will actually help quite a bit. You know, if you play on a dull surface a lot and go to something bouncier like a snare drum, you find that the double strokes are so much easier. Uh, you know, just having that. You know, fine tuning these back fingers is, is so important. You know, even if you're thinking like, well, I'm just playing a you know. A, um, just a straight bounce roll, you know, you still want to have, you know, like I said earlier, some intervention there. Um, it would be like if you had a basketball and I held it here and I let go, the ball wouldn't bounce back up right where my hands were, you know, it would bounce a little bit lower. So if I wanted it to come back, I would have to push it down a little bit and then, then it would come right back up. You kind of have to have the same mentality um, with the sticks. Um, if you want that stick to keep that momentum, that bounce going, you still kind of have to dribble it with your back fingers here, even when you're doing a double stroke. So um, fine tune those back fingers. I think that that's a huge part of it. Um, I w don't 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 wrap this thing around and force that thing to do all the work. Um, it's just it's 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 one fourth of your energy. You know, use them all. That's my take on it, at least. You know, like I said before, this. Awesome drummers who hold the sticks totally different. Um, <clears throat> and then maybe just one quick thing talking about, uh, going back to the previous question about different parts of the kit. Um, you know, when you go out to that ride cymbal technique, that's when things kind of change. You, you take what you had normally, you roll it over, and then now we're in uh, French grip. French grip is basically uh, our match grip where the thumb is on top, and then all the bottom fingers are kind of bouncing this. This is a really good way to work on your fingers in your right hand. So, uh, like I talked about before, just put it on an album. Even it doesn't even have to be jazz. I mean, it should be because you you want to work on the swing and you want to get that program in your ear what a good swing actually sounds like. So put on something with Elvin Jones and play along and and, and copy his ride cymbal. Um, but you can even just put on something that has a like bump it bump it up and that kind of pattern. Just get used to that. Throwing down a triple stroke. Also, working on flam rudiments actually helps out your triple strokes uh, as well. So, you know, any uh, if you have like a flam tap, and I take away one of my hands, they're actually both playing triple strokes. Um, so, yeah, singles in shape. Get your doubles and your triple stroke, at least in your right hand. Not as important in the left, but <coughs> you definitely want that in your right hand. All right, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, the whole thing with the specifics on how to, you know, how I like to play a ride cymbal, that, that, that would need, you know, its own video. This one's already getting out of hand. I'm almost up to an hour now. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you've made it this far, cool, man. Thanks for watching. Um, if any questions, uh, you know, just drop it in the comment box you know this isn't a dvd this is youtube so uh uh throw a question in there and i'll uh maybe answer it um so yeah any other questions let me know i think i covered all the bases uh yeah thanks for sticking uh, thanks for sticking with it talk to you later